All right, so we're now on to lab two, the histology lab. And again, this is a very difficult lab. There's a lot of, of stuff to it. Um, I'm going to make this fairly brief as I can. Um, this is a, a lab that really uh, does promote being in class to look at this. Um, and just to remember, a histologist is a medical doctor who's gone through four years of training and then extra years of training to learn this. It is a very difficult subject. And so we're going to just really hit the highlights. I want you to see um, the ways to, to kind of pick out on the slides that we have how to differentiate or tell what you're looking at and kind of, as a fine art, learning what it's not. Um, so I'm going to start with the epithelial tissue. Now, before we get into this, I want to just make sure you know that your body is made up of four different types of tissue. You've got epithelial tissue, you've got connective tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. Epithelial tissue and connective tissue are the main ones we're going to look at here. And the, uh, the thing to remember, epithelial tissue, some of the highlights of it, Epithelial tissue is always going to have a free surface, which means that it is going to have a part of that cell uh, of those tissues that's open to an empty area. So in inside the body, that empty area, like in these little areas here that we'll call the um, air sacs, so these are alveolar, and so um, alveoli, when you see, uh, when you get into... Uh, the respiratory system, these are the, air, the areas where the gas exchange is going to happen. But those little empty spots are called a lumen. So if you imagine like the inside of my, your stomach, this area is called a lumen. And the, the tissue that's going to line the wall of the stomach is epithelial tissue. Now you do have also the skin, which has a free uh, surface that's exposed to the outside world. But let's look at these. So we've got six of them. Remember also that epithelial tissue is always avascular, which means it has no direct blood supply. I'm going to have the free surface, and I'll use this little part as the free surface. Then I'm going to have a basement membrane at the bottom, which divides it from the underlying connective tissue. And the blood vessels are going to come right up to the basement membrane, drop off the good O2 and pick up. Um, the CO2 and waste products and get rid of them. Now also remember as we're naming these, and we went over this in lab uh, when we were able to be together, um, the way they name it, it's either going to be simple, like this one here, or squamous. It simply means how many cells are between the free surface and the basement membrane. If there is only one, it is simple. If there's more than one, it is squamous, or uh, um, is stratified. Um, if the cell itself is flattened, it is squamous. I was getting ahead of myself there. If it is cube-like, and remember I kind of went over this, it doesn't mean it's a perfect cube. It just means it's cube-like, roughly as wide as it is tall. They're called cuboidal. And if, and we'll see this on the next slide, they are longer or taller than they are wide, they are called columnar. And then we have a couple special uh, that we'll talk about when we get there. But those are some of the basics of connective or the epithelial connective tissue. So let's look at some of these. So we start off with simple squamous. Now in connective tissue, I do want you to know where they where these are located and some things about it. Simple squamous, simple means one layer uh, thick and squamous means flattened. So it's a single layer of flattened cells. They are in various areas. The classic example that I'm going to use are the air sacs or the alveoli. And so this is a cross-section of uh, the lungs. Now, what you want to pick up on here is these, these little areas, this little round spot here, is made up of multiple little flattened cells like a paper mache balloon. And so when you're looking at it, you can kind of see the... the um, little black dots in here that are the individual nuclei. And so uh, this is the one 
tissue type that has another one that looks similar to it, and it is adipose tissue. Now, two things. In adipose tissue, every one of these little openings right here is a single cell, and you'll have one big nucleus around, you know, by it. And that's a big difference because, again, in these, there's multiple cells making up that hollow opening. And so you're going to see multiple little nuclei. But the big thing is you see all this damage here. If we're talking about a single layer of microscopically thin cells, it's going to be hard to make a tissue slide because as I cut across this, I'm going to damage a lot of this area, which is very different from adipose tissue. And we'll look at that when we get to it in the connective tissue. Adipose tissue is... Uh, which we commonly call fat, it is easy to make a tissue slide. And if you've ever tried to cut bacon and seen the difference between it at room temperature where you're trying to wrestle with it versus if you freeze it or get it really cold, which makes it easy to cut. Uh, adipose tissue is some of the easiest tissue to make a tissue slide, so there's very rarely ever any tissue damage. And that is a big difference between these two. Uh, and again, they're the only two that really look similar. Um, and so I just want to point that out. So uh, this next one is simple cuboidal, one cell layer thick of cube-like cells. These are going to be kidney tubules. And so this is a cross-section of a kidney. And if you kind of look right here, you'll see this is a, a pretty perfect little wagon wheel. Uh, you see the lumen, this little opening right here. That's the uh, inside of that kidney tubule. And you can actually see even the basement membrane. It is this white line that's around it. And again, I'm trying to do my best to draw on this with the little uh, mouse pad. So, but that is one cell layer thick of cube-like cells. Um, you can see them all over the place. This, you know, but this these kidney tubules because they're going to be running at different angles, or some of them are going to be long wise and whatever. But this. Uh, this one right here I'm pointing to is a very good example, and that's kind of what I would use when I'm making the practical um, if I wanted to, to pick on that one. So that's simple cuboidal. Now let's look at simple columnar. A simple columnar, single layer, th layer of elongated or column-like cells. Um, this is a tissue slide from our digestive tract. Now, on the Grand Strand campus, this is the slides that we have, and they are stained red and blue. On other campuses, it might not look that way. Now, I'm not trying to tell you just to remember it as being red and blue, but that is something that as a student on Grand Strand campus, because this is the model, this is the slide that I would be testing you on or something like this, I, I'm as a student, if you remember it as the red and blue fingers, that's what happens, and I'm not going to fault you for it. I just want you to be able to identify this picture. Now, what you're looking at here would be really hard to see on uh, our judge on um, the book-wise naming of this. If you're just looking at it going, I'm going to find the basement membrane, and I'm going to see the free surface, and then I'm going to count cells, and, you know, Look, this little area looks like a little blob, if you remember the old um, Star Wars, the job of the hut. That's kind of what that looks like, so it'd be hard to tell. But on some of the areas like this, you can kind of see that it is one cell layer thick. These red little dots right there are the nuclei on this particular slide. And so um, when we're looking at it, uh, it's one cell layer thick of elongated cells. And so this is a uh, simple columnar. And again, it is in the digestive tract. Now, as you get farther along in A&P, you'll start being able to judge things from the anatomy, the appearance, and what it's going to do, the physiology, to kind of put them together. In the digestive tract, we are all about absorption. So we need a lot of surface area. And so that's why we have these little, they're called villi, these fingers in there. Now, I know that in... in person in class we can enlarge this so you can see but there's some little clear cells that you can kind of see all along here and these cells and here's a whole bunch of them right on this one but these cells are called goblet cells they're kind of clear bluish white uh, depending on which one you see their job is to secrete um, mucus and while that might sound kind of gross, it is vitally important because that's what allows things to move along. 
So that's one of the things. Now these microvilli, uh, you'll talk about in lecture, microvilli are surface modifications and they're so small you cannot see them. But um, it, you'll see pictures in the book that will have these long cells and then you'll have this wavy surface on top and all that is is there's actually the the cell membrane is going to form these waves back and forth and it kind of looks like Bart Simpson's hair there but uh, again that's the whole point of that is it is increasing surface area but you'll never see it on this without really high power um, you know, magnification. And when I say high power, I mean more than the high power objective. I'm talking about probably like oil immersion. But the goblet cells you can see. Then we go to what our first one with a kind of a weird name, pseudo stratified columnar. Now pseudo means false. So what happens with this is when they had more rudimentary microscopes, it looked like it was layered, so they called it stratified columnar. But when they got better microscopes, they realized that that wasn't the case. It just looked like it. So if I have the free surface and the basement membrane here, what's happening is the cells are going to have all kinds of little undulations as they go through. And so we're going to have some nuclei that are going to be down at the bottom. And then all of a sudden we're going to have one up at the top here, you know, one kind of midway, one at the bottom. And so then when they were looking, they thought that these were all layers and then realized it wasn't. So they named it pseudostratified, which simply means that it is falsely layered. So this is going to be in the respiratory tract. Now the one thing to remember, these are both columnar cells and they're kind of cousins. Uh, you'll learn as you go along that your digestive tract and your respiratory tract have a common origin. We call it the pharynx. It's kind of the, the th area of the throat, quote unquote, that's behind your nose and mouth. And just underneath your mandible, just underneath your jaw, there's a dividing line. Some of that, uh, the, the tube will split. Some one tract goes down to the digestive tract through the esophagus into the stomach. The other goes down into the respi respiratory tract through the trachea. And so they're kind of cousins, so you can kind of tie in that they're both columnar cells. Um, so these are called pseudostratified, and you can see a very clear basement membrane. This right here is what we call the lumen. Uh, this is actually your throat. All right, it's, um, I'm trying to put that in there. I probably just need to quit trying to spell things. Uh, anyway, um, two things that are here. One, you can see goblet cells again, and that's what they're called, goblet cells, and they do the same thing. They secrete mucus, and we know it if we get into allergy season, we start being phlegmy, quote, unquote. And again, while it sounds gross, that is a very important way your body uses to defend you. And along with that, we're going to have a surface modification, which we can see on this one, called cilia. So unlike over here where the surface modification is actually just wavy um, uh, cell membrane to increase surface area, over on this side what happens is it is like little hairs. And they're called cilia, and their job is to move any debris that gets trapped by the mucus and gets stuck on the lining. And like little crowd surfers, if I have something here, there's some little dust particle that's mean or this, these are going to wave back and forth like crowd surfers and get this bad guy out of there. And you can kind of see it on this, this picture. Um, you can see a little clear line right along the top and that is cilia. So we got simple columnar in the digestive tract and pseudostratified so now we look at our first stratified um, epithelial tissue, and it's called stratified squamous. Now the bad thing about this is squamous means flat, but if you look at the cells, you can easily see, all right, so here's the, and it's a wavy basement membrane. And the, we'll look in the next lab, we're gonna look at um, the integumentary system, the skin, which is what this is, and you'll see why these little um, undulations are, are here on in the basement membrane. But if I looked at the basement membrane, I can easily see that there's more than just one cell. So I'll know it's stratified, but these cells aren't flat until they get way up top here. 
So it's hard to name it like that, but the way to look at it again, this wavy basement membrane and this fog-like appearance that's on the surface, which is simply dead skin cells that are being sloughed off, these are classic signs of stratified squamous. This is the outer layer of skin. We're going to look at this in the next lab and learn that this is called the uh, epidermis, uh, the outer layer of the dermis, the epidermis. And so if, when you're cleaning your house or your apartment you're, and you clean the dust, what you're cleaning is um, dead skin cells for the most part. And they're really, really well designed. Again, while it sounds gross, what's happening is as these little invaders start to try and get in and uh, get a foothold on you, uh, or grr, and they're, they're trying to you know, do bad things to you, these little um, dead skin cells just slip off and this guy slips off with them. It's a very good layup, layout to help. Um, it does a great job and um, a lot of times things you don't realize how great of a job till it's not there and so if someone was to get a third degree burn which kind of destroys this layer um, they are susceptible to all kinds of infections and so it's amazing how effective this really is and again you don't see it until it's not there so the next one we look at and the last one is another trend uh, another um uh, stratified, but in this is called transitional, and it's simply called transitional. Transitional epithelium does just that. It changes shape. That's why it's called transitional. This is lining the urinary bladder. So you can kind of see it almost looks like little little um, airbags through here. This, this what I'm drawing on this part, that's the basement membrane, that's the free surface, and they are like little airbags. When the bladder is empty, they expand out and fill in the empty space. As the coffee is flowing, or if it's happy hour and beer's on special and you're drinking more fluids and the fluids get in here, then these shrink back to allow for more area. Once you go to the restroom, empty the pool, they expand back out, and so they're always transitioning in the way they look, and so that's why we call them transitional. So those are the, the six types of epithelial tissue. Um, now we're going to move on to connective tissue, but I hope you see the epithelial tissue is fairly straightforward. Um, there, you know, it's none of these really look the same, especially on the transitional side. Now, as we move on to the next, you'll see that adipose tissue and uh, the simple squamous does have some similarities. But I'm going to move on to the next one. So now we get to dense, and I and it doesn't have it on this, but it's dense regular, and I'm not going to spell it out. Connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue is the tissue of tendons and ligaments. And as it says here, it has a very poor blood supply. So epithelial tissue has no blood supply, but actually the cells reproduce really quickly and they're designed to, because it's the design of it. In connective tissue, the ability for the tissue to, to heal itself um, is directly tied to the blood supply. So tendons and ligaments, when they're damaged, it is very hard for them to heal, and it's because of the lack of blood supply. Now, on dense regular connect connective tissue, it's named that, and you can kind of see it looks like this big river of slime, the pink river of slime from Ghostbusters two years ago, right? What it is is there are densely packed, regularly aligned fibers that will help give strength to this tissue. And it only needs to be strong in one direction. That's why the fibers are in one direction. So I'll have a little bone over here that's coming and it's going to be attached to a muscle on this side. The muscle itself is going to contract and pull this way. And so I want this tissue to be strong in this direction. So all of the fibers line up in that direction. It gives it, I sacrifice the strength in the other directions because I don't have fibers that way and I put all my fibers in this way and that means that it is as strong as possible in this direction. That's why it is called dense regular connective tissue. The tissue of tendons and ligaments. 
Now, as we uh, get forward, we'll talk about muscles and we're going to talk about bones. And so I'll just throw this out there that tendons are what link muscles to bones and ligaments are what link bones to bones. Tendons tie muscles to bones, ligaments link bones together. Uh, we'll get into that as we move along. But this is dense regular connective tissue, densely packed, regularly aligned fibers for tendons and ligaments. Now these two, elastic connective tissue is going to have a lot of elastic fibers in it. Now this is a, a, a tissue slide of the skin. And you can kind of see up here, these are, that's the, um, those, the uh, stratified squamous of the epidermis here. But all of these little fibers that are going out and through here, those are all uh, elastic fibers. And your skin has to stretch in a lot of different ways. A lot of times elastic fiber is called dense irregular connective tissue because the fibers are spread out all over. They're going in all kinds of directions because, again, your skin needs to be strong and be able to be pulled and come back in multiple directions. To me, this slide looks like um, a Monet painting. Now, this slide in particular is no longer available uh, on the Grandstand campus. It broke. Uh, the ones we have are a little bit, are, are a lot lighter than this, and it's hard to see. And in lab, I don't test you on these slides because I don't think that they show up well. But I do want you to see this picture of one that does look correct. So now we get to reticular connective tissue. Again, not worried about where these are. Reticular connective tissue is going to be a lot in a lot of the lymphatic systems, but in multiple areas. Reticular is a type of fiber. It's a very thin fiber. It's kind of a netting. And now the thing about this, it's very unique, is that it is the only tissue slide that stains so purple it's actually brown. To me, this looks like tree bark. All right, so all of these, all of this right in through here, this is reticular connective tissue. And again, uh, to me, it looks like tree bark. Now, is that going to be, if you are going to go talk to a histologist and they tell you, you know, and you tell them that your professor said that reticular connective tissue looked like tree bark, he might be upset with me. But all of the slides that we have of reticular tissue look like tree bark. If you can remember that, that will help you identify it now. As you move forward, if you decide to be a histologist, you'll learn a bunch of different ways to name these. I'm just trying to help you see this right now. Then we get to the classic example of, of how if you already have a background of knowledge of a substance, the picture will stick with you. This is bone. Now, uh, some of you will see this and know it right away. Some of you now you see it and you're like, oh, what this is, is bone. Now, when we get into um, the, the osteology lab, which is coming up, I think it's week four, you'll start seeing and be able to identify some of these things. These little guys here, these are the bone cells. They're called osteocytes. Site is a suffix, which means cell. That's a good thing to remember. Osteo means bone. You're going to see all these little layers around it. It's always listed as it looks like tree rings. It looks like a cross section of a tree. And it does. And that's an easy way to remember it. So this is a cross section of bone. Now what I want to tell you is, just kind of point out, if I put this on the practical, hardly anybody ever misses it. Because everybody remembers bone, and the reason you remember it is you come into lab already with a little section of your brain that understands what bone is. You've got literally a file inside your brain with information about bone. So when you see this, there's already a place to put it. So you see this, it's boom, I know what this is, it's bone. That's why it's so important to study these and look at them. And I'm not saying like pour over them constantly, but, you know, just think of, you know, if you take, you know, these pictures are pretty easy to, to copy and if you put them on a little slide or something where you're looking and just kind of refresh your memory. You don't have to study everything about them. Look at it. Say, all right, this is bone. All right. This is because you're not going to come into class generally with a file about simple squamous, um, you know, or if you do, it's a pretty thin file. So my point being is 
this is where when you start building a foundation from the bottom and have a knowledge of what something is, when you add to that knowledge, like a picture of bone, it sticks so much easier. Now we get into some of my favorite is cartilage. So there's three types of cartilage. Three types of cartilage. The first two, highland and elastic that are listed here, look very similar uh, as far as the, the actual anatomy of it. But the look of them is very different. Highland cartilage is the most common type of cartilage in the body. As a matter of fact, it's exactly what your bones start off as. Your, your skeleton starts off as a highland cartilage model and then gets converted. Uh, but it's all over. It's the cartilage in your ribs. It's the cartilage, you know, it's, it is the main cartilage of the body. Now, in this picture, which they don't all look like this, they don't all have this Pepto Bismol pink look to them. But the cartilage part, which, and I'm going to highlight this little band here, this is the cartilage. Let's see if this works so I don't destroy it again. So, that little band of cartilage is always going to be very smooth looking. Highland cartilage is smooth. And so kind of the way I look at it, if I want something all over my body, I kind of want it to be smooth and comfortable. Unlike the counterpart here of elastic cartilage. If you look at the band of cartilage that's here, that looks very rough. It almost looks like a little match matchbox strike strip where you can strike the matches to get them to light. It looks very rough like sandpaper. Now this is found in two areas. Uh, one you can touch and that's your outer ear. That's what I would recommend you remember. It's the outer ear. I mean the highland cartilage, I would remember it's the uh, cartilage, the bones start off as cartilage, uh, the highland cartilage. But this is the outer ear. It's also a place called the epiglottis which we'll study when we get into 211. Um, but the ear is the easy way to see it. And this is a cross-section of an ear. This is actually the ear. Now, I remember, I like to remember it this way. I teach it this way. I hope everybody knows who Mike Tyson was or is. Um, and you might not. But Mike Tyson, um, the way I remember this now or I like to teach it is, Mike Tyson bit Evander Holyfield's ear. Now, Iron Mike Tyson is now kind of elastic Mike Tyson because his mood swings very much. Now, I still respect the guy, and I'm very scared of him because, you know, he's a, he, he's a, he's a bad man. But anyway, um, in my mind, in order to remember this, you, you know, I like to teach it as Iron Mike is now elastic Mike. He really lost a lot of his iron aura when he bit Evander Holyfield's ear. Elastic cartilage is in the ear. And then finally, the last one is fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is, you know, if I was able to get away with it, I, I say this during lab, I would make this into a, a print of some sort of uh, artwork and put it up on the wall because I think it's actually really pretty. Um, fibrocartilage is going to be the cartilage that's in between the vertebrae, the intervertebral discs are hyaline or a fibrocartilage. This is a cartilage of shock absorbing. Uh, also the symphysis pubis, which we'll look at when we look at the skeletal system, is going to have this fibrocartilage there. Now to me this looks like a very, very crystal blue ocean, a sun and a nice really red sunset. So a beautiful sunset on a really blue ocean. Now there's only two slides on the Grand Strand campus, two types of tissue that have really red and blue staining to them. Fibrocartilage, and if you go back in the Wayback Machine when we were looking at the uh, simple uh, columnar of the digestive tract, that was also red and blue. It looks like fingers. They don't look the same, but red and blue are two things that you could remember. Fibrocartilage and simple columnar are both very red and blue. That's a, a one way to tie them together here. And then the last one we look at is blood. Uh, blood again looks like a bunch of little pink donuts. It is uh, very, um, it's, a, it's the only liquid connective tissue. Um, uh, so it's a very interesting thing. I shouldn't say it's the only because there's that could get into a little uh, discussion about stuff, but it is a liquid connective tissue. 
and it has three types of cells in them. You'll look at this when you get into 211. They're called formed elements. You don't have to know that. But this is a picture of blood. And so blood looks like a bunch of little, little pink donuts. And again, this one and the bone, if I was to put these on the practical, um, hardly anybody would miss them. And it really is because you already have an idea of what blood is. You already have a file with that. Well, that is the histology of the, the, the slides. Now we're going to look at muscle and nervous tissue just to give a brief overview. They, already ha they will have their own special labs for them. Now this is still another picture of blood, so just want, I didn't realize that was on there. But this is another picture of blood. So now we talk about muscles. Now again, we've got our own lab for muscles, but I want to just kind of point out the things that I expect you to know right now. There are three types of muscles. Now muscle is a tissue that's designed to contract with force, so it helps things move. Now um, skeletal muscle is the only one of the three that is voluntary, and that's a really important thing. As a matter of fact, skeletal muscle is pretty much the only thing that's voluntary in your body. It's about the only thing you have control over, and um, it sets it apart. Another thing to understand is skeletal muscle is the only muscle that is going to be considered part of the muscular system. Smooth muscle and cardiac muscle have their own special systems that they're going to be on. Uh, be associated with. So like smooth muscle, it's the walls of organs. So you're talking about the stomach. The stomach's in the digestive system. Uh, cardiac muscle obviously is in the heart, so it is in the uh, cardiovascular system. So skeletal muscle is the only one voluntary. So uh, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle are involuntary. Then we look at skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are striated. They have this striped appearance where smooth muscle does not have that. So it's called non-striated. And that's the reason it's called smooth muscle because it doesn't have those stripes. And then the last thing I want to make sure you know is that cardiac muscle has these special things called intercalated discs. And the reason that is is the cardiac muscle has to bind to uh, other cardiac muscle cells. Skeletal muscle binds to bones on either side, so it has a good connection and it's strong. Cardiac muscle has to contract very hard, so it has these special welded junctions between the cells, and it shows up like these dark bands called intercalated discs. And so those should be something you already come into this, uh, this semester knowing for, from prereqs. Three types of muscles, skeletal smooth cardiac, Skeletal muscle is the only one that's voluntary. Smooth and cardiac are considered involuntary. Skeletal muscle and cardiac are striated, where smooth muscle, because it's non-striated, that's why it's called smooth. And then finally, cardiac muscle has these special intercalated discs. And then lastly, the nervous system. The nervous system, uh, the star of the show, is something called a neuron. And now this is an amazing, amazing, amazing cell. The thing I want you to know right now about a neuron is this, that it's going to have a cell body, which just makes sense. And then I'm going to have two types of appendages that come off of it. I'm going to have one type that's bringing information into the cell body, and this is called a dendrite. You can have one or multiple dendrites. Dendrites bring information into the cell body. And again, you can have multiple dendrites. The other type is called an axon. Axon takes the information away from the cell body to another cell. It could be another neuron, it could be a muscle cell, or whatever. The axon takes it away. There's only one axon for every neuron. So you can have multiple dendrites, but you will always only have one axon. And that's the nervous system, or the, the neuron, the star of the show, the nervous system. And that's the histology lab.